How was your day? Good. 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 So last lot of the day, uh, I need your help basically to keep me awake. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe it's the other way around. I'm not sure. Should we throw things? But <laughs> oh, sorry. Should we throw things at you? Okay? you? <laughs> that would keep me awake. <laughs> Okay, so uh, good to see you here. My name is Andrea, Andrea Provalio, and uh, I'd like to talk about value, uh, which is a subject I've been thinking about for uh, quite some time. Uh, but in the last year, it's been something I've been thinking about quite a lot. Um, the reason is that I work with companies. What I try to do is I try to help companies move into the 21st century, um, which means reviewing their cultural models, their processes, and so on, blah, blah, blah. So this idea of value uh, comes up quite a lot of times. Because you know, in, in Agile, we are supposed to deliver value on a regular basis, right? That's what we are supposed to do, deliver value on a regular basis. Um, so what is your definition of value? What, what would you consider value? How do you measure value? Uh, it's a question. Uh, I'd like to hear from you. Um, the level of impact. I'm sorry? The level of impact. The world has of the question. Good. Customer? Okay. Yes? Money in the door. Money? Money? Okay. Anything else? Value? Behavior change. Rate of change. Behavior change. Think behavior change. Oh, behavioral change. Okay. You see, it's not, it's not, an, e not an easy question, right? <laughs> I've been thinking about this for the last year and I still don't have an answer. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping that you will get out of this door with more questions than when you came in. Okay. Um, but then again, any, any other definition of value? What, what would, you, would you consider value? Yes, please. So whatever the input is, we get relevant output for the input. That's what value relevant is. output? Yeah, for the given input, yes. From, from a given input. Yeah. Uh, value with respect to what? You didn't precisely formulate the question. That's my point. <laughs> That's my point. Um, let me tell you what I found uh, doing a little bit of research. You no, know, before I came up with this topic, I interviewed quite a lot of people. I interviewed my clients. I interviewed colleagues. Uh, so I, I tried to come up with different pers perspectives. And also, I looked at the official you know, publications. So. What do the experts consider to be of value? Now, in the Agile Manifesto, value is explicitly stated, right? What we do is we constantly deliver valuable software. There's only one problem, they don't define value. They say it's valuable, but they don't say what does it mean to be valuable, okay? Which could be a good idea, or maybe not, and we're going to find out. Um, in the Scrum Guide, they mention value 17 times and they never give a definition of value. Okay? Um, so I looked at training materials. This is a PO certification <laughs> course. Okay? In, the, in, in, the PO, in the product owner certification course, they say that for a value, sorry, for a profit organization, value is basically money. Okay? For a profit organization, value is money. Okay? And then you ask Norman Jeffries, and he says, value is what you want. Okay? If you want it, it's because it has value for you. It's not necessarily money, it could be something else. Okay? Or you could ask Tom. You could ask Tom Hill. Tom is very precise, he has a very engineering mindset. But he says that value is a perceived benefit. So what we think we're going to get from whatever we do. Okay? It's similar, but not the same thing. Uh, then you ask Goku. Goku goes on a tangent and says that a value is an esoteric concept in the mind of the stakeholders. Okay? So you see, we, we go from we have very different perspectives. Uh, some people say, yeah, it's just money. Okay, money is value. Some people refuse to define value. Other people say that, yeah, it's there, but we don't exactly know because it's in the mind of the customers. It's, it's weird. Okay? So, very confused. And then, we have values. And in this talk, what I would like to do is to try to make a connection between value and values. Because what you value is based on your values. 
and so it's the same for the customer. And these are all values. Some people value learning, collaboration, revenue, uh, information, learning. These are all values for different people. So at the end of the day, I decided that to give a structure to my thinking, first of all, and also to give a structure to the talk, I decided to distill the question about value in deliver what to whom and why. Deliver what to whom and for what reason and why. Okay? And these are also three different sections in the talk. So I'm going to start with the what. Okay? Let's talk about money. Let's talk about money first. So money is important. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it is. It's fundamental. Um, it's also a trading indicator, meaning that if we use money to assess our capacity to deliver value, that information could come too late. Finding out after three months that you lost $2 million, it's interesting, but could be too late. Okay? Um, and of course, money is important because money is in a certain way like food for people, right? We need food to survive, we need food to live, but we don't live to eat, right? And this is the same for companies. Companies, they feed on money, they need money for their survival, but surviving is not the reason why they are in business. It's they're in business for something else. And money is a fundamental asset to do that. So profitability is important, but it's a mean to an end. It's not the end in itself. Okay? Um, but there is a lot of attention these days about profitability. And the reason, one of the reasons, of course, is that um, it, it, it depends on how companies are run these days. Uh, there is this wonderful talk by Ricardo Sandler that you can uh, watch on uh, uh, TED, and I highly recommend it. And at some point, during the Q&A at the end, is that he explains that in most executives these days, they need to demonstrate quarterly how well the company is doing. So they work on a three months mandate. Now, which kind of long-term plan, long-term value can you implement in three months? So the attention is directed to money because money is immediately measurable, but not because it's necessarily a good indicator. Okay? So let's talk about money. Oh, by the way, I also had an interesting conversation with Alan Kelly uh, a couple of months ago about, about money and value. And uh, he pointed out that one of the definitions of money is that money is a store of value. Money is a store of value, which is a good <coughs> definition. But that means that money is not value. Money is a store for value. It's kind of a, it's like transforming energy into something else and then reconverting that something else into something different again. So money is a store for value, but it's not necessarily value. Hmm? So, I'm still talking about the what, okay? What do we mean by value? Now, Tom, as I mentioned, has a very, Tom Hill, has a very engineering mindset. Um, and sometimes I, when, when I look at uh, the way Tom describes value, and uh, I had some conversation with Tom, um, I was not, not necessarily convinced, not exactly convinced, that you can measure everything as he claims. But then I realized something. Um, when Tom says that you can quantify everything, meaning that you can attach a number to anything, what he's actually saying is that if you do so, you must, to be able to do so, you must have a very precise and detailed conversations about what you want to measure. If you need to attach a number to something, you need to discuss very precisely what that something is. So, we question, how do you measure happiness at work? Some strange concept, right? How do you, how do you measure, how do you quantify happiness on the workplace? It's up to us. We could just count the smiles, okay? We count how many times people smile at work. 
I'm not saying that it's necessarily a good indicator, but at least we need to think about how we're going to measure happiness. And by doing so, we came to a shared understanding of what we mean by happiness. So just the, the, the exercise of quantifying something forces you to go deep into questioning what you're going to measure and why. Okay? And of course, you can uh, measure the current state, future state, the desired state, blah, 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 blah. But having the conversation is the key point. Having the conversation about what you want to measure is the key point. So, what do we want to deliver? It's up to us. We could deliver, for instance, uh, for us, for a company, um, value could be uh, market share, that's very easy to measure, or it could be image, okay? The company wants to have a sound image and, and be perceived as a honest company, whatever that means, okay? But if that is value, we need to start understanding exactly what we mean by being honest. Because my being honest could be different from another person's being honest. So having this conversation is fundamental. And so we need to talk about stakeholders, other people. Okay? Now, I actually prefer the term actors, because I, I'm using a definition by Alistair Cover. And he's saying that stakeholders are like actors because in a play, some actors are on stage and they are visible to the audience, but other actors are off stage. You don't see them, but at some point they jump on stage and they say, no, that's not what I want. <laughs> um, I, I, know, I, I see you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I also heard sometimes the definition stealth holder. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which is a pretty good one, I think. Okay. Um, so when I looked around, uh, uh, trying to figure out what is value of our stakeholders, stakeholders, I came across, I think, about 20 or 25 different definitions of stakeholder. Okay. So it's the same story as value. We have 20 definitions of value. We have 20 definitions of stakeholders. Okay. So eventually, I said sort of this one. Okay. A stakeholder is anyone who is influenced or can influence the outcome of a project. So if someone decides to build a nuclear plant two miles from here, okay, people living in this town are stakeholders, even though they don't put in any money into the project, okay, because they are heavily influenced by the outcome. Okay? So I decided for this one. And one thing that is very important to, to, to look at if you start thinking about value is who are the stakeholders. Now, I, I know that the screen is a bit small. I know that the font is even smaller. But um, I can help you out a little bit. So these are stakeholders from a real project I worked in. Uh, it was a bank. And you have different types of stakeholders from <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, tricky but doable. Um, Headquarter, uh, project manager, product manager, uh, legal department, blah, 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 blah. Okay, different stakeholders in this specific project. Um, some people like to put the stakeholders on a quadrant and try to describe how much interest every stakeholder has in the project and how much power they have in that project. Now, having power means, for instance, they can pull the plug. If somebody can pull the plug from the project and kill it, they have the maximum power. But they're not necessarily interested. So in that example, the headquarter could pull the plug on the project. But they are also taking care of 50 other projects. So their interest is not probably on this one completely. Okay? But the product manager or the project manager they don't have as much power, but they have much more interest. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is because it connects to something I'm going to talk about later. Um, I'm going to skip this couple of questions because we're going to 
much time. But identifying the stakeholders, when you want to really understand what value means, it's one of the key steps. And I, I'm going back to this later. Now, the thing is that for every single stakeholder, you have different perceptions of value. Because every different stakeholder can have multiple objectives. Every single stakeholder can have multiple objectives. And for each objective, there are multiple strategies to achieve it. Okay. So in this example, one stakeholder is a customer operations manager, whatever that means. Okay. It's just a fictional example. Um, so for that guy, so that person has four goals. Okay. Provide good customer service. Uh, our clients recommend our service. Lower operational costs, a shorter cycle, and all different goals. All of, these, of those goals have value for that stakeholder. And for each goal, there are different ways to achieve the goal, different strategies. Now, you can multiply this by all the stakeholders in the project, and you can see the mess. Okay. You can see why it's so difficult to talk about value when we don't oversimplify just by saying value is mine. Okay. Um, or are like, how are we doing so far? Still awake. <laughs> okay. Just um, the other thing, of course, is that these um, different values can be interconnected. So in that example over there, at the top <coughs> level, you see uh, the, the, the vertical axis. It says organizational tiers. So the top tier of the organization could be, for instance, the shareholders, the owners, not the stakeholders, the shareholders. Okay? And for the shareholders, for that specific stakeholder, uh, profit and market share are fundamental. Those are the two goals. And for those two goals, they could have multiple strategies, like trade, reducing training costs by 10%. Or uh, incrementing user productivity by 40%. Okay. Goal strategy. Now, what we see in this example is that the goals, sorry, the strategies at one level, they become goals on the lower tier. Okay. So, for instance, for um, let's say could, those would be the project managers, the training cost is a goal, and the strategy becomes make the product intuitive and make it perform better. So, so it's a kind of a hierarchical point of view. Still, it's not enough because it's kind of like managed by objectives. Right? So you have top people who give top objectives and these, it's a hierarchical structure. Okay. So it's not, a, in my opinion, it's not a, a full uh, holistic perception of value. Okay? And there's another thing. When you do something like that, if you impose measurable goals from the top, you kill motivation, right? If you impose a goal from the top, you kill intrinsic motivation. People become motivated to reach the goal for their own self-interest, not for the sake of the project. <coughs> so you kill intrinsic motivation. So, let's take a slightly different approach. What I'm trying to say is that when you talk about value, you're basically dealing with something that is deeply rooted in the human mindset. Different people have different perceptions of value. And all these perceptions are interconnected. So what I'm saying is that, you see, in the map I used before, there is one detail that I intentionally not provided earlier. And that detail is that every stakeholder has an influence on other stakeholders. Okay? So, um, on the bottom left, you see clients. Clients have low power and low interest. So why should we care? Well, we should care because if these guys are not happy, they can influence other stakeholders. If they start complaining, for instance, that the product is not stable, and that generates a lot of uh, customer support calls. And, those, and these calls escalate the product manager, escalate the headquarter 
Now, these low network stakeholders become very influent in the system. So, what I'm saying is that this is actually a complex adaptive system. <coughs> stakeholders and their needs and their perception of value form a complex system that is not completely predictable by definition of complex system. Okay? Which is why, for instance, in Agile we like to deliver frequently because that's a way to, to, to probe the system. Right? You give something to this, to this uh, stakeholder system and you see how the system reacts. And if there is any change to be made, you make it. Right? So it's a complex adaptive system. And it's not only complex at the overall stakeholder level, it's also complex in the individual level. So, uh, let me give you an example. So as that explains, you see a stakeholder there, stakeholder one, uh, stakeholder two, stakeholder three, and then you have goals and objectives and strategies and so on. Okay. Um, a very simple example that you might be familiar with. This. The project manager is under pressure because the client is expecting the product for, for, yes, for a certain deadline. The deadline is approaching, so the project manager, manager starts putting pressure on the development team. The development team, they are very skilled, very technically skilled persons. They, they love what they do and they like to write good code, but you put them under pressure, so they write crappy code. That crappy code generates technical debt, and the technical debt surfaces after a couple of months, a couple of weeks, and so on, and that generates other problems for, for the product manager, and so on, so on, so on, right? It's a, it's a systemic behavior. In this case, it's, it's a, what we call a reinforcing loop. We do something that reinforces, in this case, exactly what we don't want to have. Okay? We don't want to have that kind of problem, but our behavior reinforces the problem. The thing is, you don't see it immediately because there is a delay in the system, and so you realize it that when it's too late. Okay? But that's because of the conflicting values. The product manager values being on time with the delivery. The technical teams value writing good code, and these two values conflict with each other in, under certain situations. So some people get stressed out, in short. Which brings me to talk about values, what we value, not, what, not just what is value, but what we value. Now values are a very, um, uh, let's say, tricky thing to talk about. Because values are different for every person, but in general you can say that values, are, they, uh, serve as a reference point in everybody's life. Uh, for some people, being reliable is a value. Uh, for other people, being creative and not necessarily reliable is more important. And then depending on different moments in your life, one value could overcome another. So, it, you know, it's complicated. Um, as I mentioned, when I was you know, thinking about the single value, I interviewed a lot of people. Uh, so I interviewed colleagues, friends, uh, clients, and so on. And so these are real answers that I received from people when I asked them, what do you value in your profession? Okay. In what you do, what is it that you value? Now, this, of course, has no statistical relevance because the sample was too small. Okay, but it's give, to give an idea. So I spoke with a business owner, and they said that for them, measurability is more important than predictability. Meaning that they understand that every figure, every estimate we give is worth almost nothing because things change so frequently. So it's more important for them to know how we are doing now than being sure that in six months we'll be there. So measurability, having reference points, every, having metrics, uh, having something that helps them making decisions every single day is more important than predict the future because they can't. Okay? Uh, impact is more important than scope what we deliver and the impact it has on the market is more important than what 
than the content itself. The impact is more important than the content. Okay? And so on and so on and so on. Um, an agency, uh, the delivery company owner, told me that for, for him, making the world a better place is what he values in his work. So we make software to make somebody's life better, or easier, or better. And we also make money, which is good. Okay? We make money for the company, for the employees, for everyone, but, because we need the money, right? But what we do is we try to make the world a better place, okay? in terms of values, or helping people make their lives better and more fulfilling. Well, an IT manager told me that for, for him, sustainability and compliance was extremely valuable. Of, uh, when he said sustainability, he meant economical, financial, and technical sustainability of their projects. So financial and technical sustainability was very important for him. Um, the product owner, I, I spoke with a few product owners. They told me, you know, making things happen is something we like. Or we like constructive negotiation. Because part of our work is to talk with all the stakeholders. We need to make these people agree on something. Okay? So this kind of constructive negotiation is something is fulfilling for them. Now, to give you an idea what why values are so important, I decided to, to pick uh, Merck. Merck is a pharmaceutical company. Okay? And uh, that's an example of connecting values to value to measurable outcome. Okay? Uh, Merck has a value book which they developed over the last, I think, two decades. And this book is, is a booklet and it's available to every single employee in the company. Okay? So if you work for Merck, you know exactly why they are in business. And one of their statements is, we are in the business, so we are not a humanitarian initiative, we, are, we do business. But we are in the business of preserving and improving human life. That's our business. Okay? We preserve human life. That's our business. Okay? And all of our actions, which means their strategies, goals, strategies, <coughs> you know, whatever we do, will be measured. So remember Tom Gill? He says you can quantify everything, anything. Okay? So every, every goal, every strategy will be measured in our success in achieving that goal. So how can they do that? Well, very simple. Uh, for instance, one, one thing that these guys do is they give away medicines for free in poor countries. And they measure. Okay? Uh, five years ago, 10,000 people died, died, used to die for this specific disease, and now <coughs> it's 5,000 people. Okay, we achieved our goal. Okay, and we also made this works. Well, not in that country, but somewhere else. So the thing is, having keeping values in mind, keeping why you do something, it's a good starting point, and that works in IT as well. Asking the question to your clients, for instance, or to the users. Uh, so why do you need this? Why do you want this? It's a good starting point. Um, let me give you an example. I would tell my wife, I would ask my wife a question like, okay, so where should we fly for our next vacation? Now, if I, if I say something like this, the implication is that we should fly. Okay? But I never ask the question, why should we go anywhere? Which kind of vacation do we, want? do we want? Do we want to relax? Do we want to learn something new? Do we want to go and meet people that we haven't seen for a long time? So why are we doing this? Okay. And it may turn out that if we just want to relax, I live, I live close to Venice in Italy, and we're about two hours drive from the, from the Alps. Okay. I could drive for a couple of hours and be in a beautiful scenery for a week. So why should I fly? The thing is, if I start from the why, I have a whole range of options in front of me. If I start from the why. If I start from the what should I do, 
my options are very narrow. If I say where should I fly, I want to go to, to, to the Alps, which is probably cheaper and nicer and flying for a long time. So this book, Value Focused Thinking, is very interesting if you, if you want to start a reasoning in these terms. Now, sometimes values, as I mentioned, values collide. Okay? You have two different values. And you would like to, to, to uh, respect both of these values, but somehow they contradict each other. Now, the question is how to find a compromise. I have this sentence. The, te the test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two different ideas in mind and still be able to function. It's not a matter of compromise, it's a matter of doing both at the same time saving lives and making money at the same time. Okay. It's not one or the other, it's one and the other. Okay. Making money and saving lives. So it, it's all about, you know, if you, if you, you cannot think about value if you don't think about values. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Because they're all interconnected. They're all interconnected. You start from the values and your different criteria to assess your values, you have your concrete goals, you do whatever you need to do and you have a measurable impact and you need to try to, 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 need to keep everything all together. So, I tried to find a graphical representation of the uh, nature of value and values and I settled for this one. Okay? From this, I settled for this initial uh, picture. Because I like this one, because we have different people, they go in different directions, they live on different planes. Some of these people will never intersect because they live on different planes, okay. but they're all part of the same system. They're all interconnected one way or another. Okay. And, and so for me, value is multidimensional. Can, me, can mean different things at the same time. It's systemic, everything is interconnected. It's contextual. What we value today is not what we're going to value next month or what we valued last month. It's contextual. It's subjective. Different people have different perceptions and it changes all the time. It's the okay. uh, So how do you live in this complicated world? Um, well, one thing I've learned, for instance, <coughs> is that um, you know this idea that we prioritize by value? Well, another, th another thing I've learned uh, interviewing different product owners is that virtually everyone told me that it's virtually impossible for them to attach value to in single user stories. It's virtually impossible to say this user story is going to have this business value. We would like it. We, we would like it to be so. Okay. But the thing is, it's not possible because the only thing you can do is you can. You need to put this user story. You need to put this feature. You need to put it out into the world and see how the world reacts. Which is why John here this morning he was explaining why it's so important to deliver something frequently and in small steps because you are constantly probing the system. Okay, you probe the system all the time. So that's one thing you do. In your production environment, what you do is you try to come up with small things that you can implement and deliver frequently and on a completely different dimension, probably with the entire stakeholder stack, you talk about values. You talk about what is it that you value with this world? Is there anything different? Something changing your world? <coughs> but value and values, they, they are not the same thing. They are interconnected, but they are not the same thing. Um, just checking the time. So, let's say that you decide to um, start thinking about values. Um, what people value, not value per se. One thing you want to be uh, aware of is that every time you do a partial optimization of a system, 
you probably compromise the overall performance in other terms. If you optimize on only one value, something else is going to suffer. And I'll give you an example. I mean, I've been working with organizations uh, for, for a long time. So I've been struggling through this process of helping them to uh, observe their mindset and change it. Um, let me give you an instance. Well, personal agendas, that's clearly, that's a clear example of one value that is working against other values. If I'm a project manager, and I have my own hidden personal agenda, and I do things not for the sake of the project, for the sake of the company, for the sake of the users, but I do that only to, you know, to climb the corporate ladder and build my career, if I have a personal agenda like that, that means that that person values a lot personal development and career, but that comes at the expense of other parts of the system, right? Uh, that's an example of local optimization. Another example of local optimization is I used product features. Uh, I, I assume you know that in large products, almost 30, 40% of the features are virtually never used, okay? Just take a map of work, okay? It has billions of features, and I'm pretty sure that nobody in this room has ever used all of them, right? Okay, so why do we do that? What is the value? We, I don't know, it depends on the specific product, specific company, but it could just be that we value <coughs> looking busy so much okay, that we develop stuff nobody wants, but at least we keep ourselves busy, okay? We are saving jobs, okay, from the company. Okay? By developing stuff nobody's going to use anyway. Or uh, that's another example, right, of local optimization. Another example of local optimization is projects with excessive bureaucracy. Now I'm not against bureaucracy, okay? I'm against excessive bureaucracy. Way too much bureaucracy compared to what is actually needed. Okay? So why do you think we have project with projects with a lot of bureaucracy, more than needed? What do you think is that? Low what, trust. I'm sorry? Low trust, isn't it? Low trust. Sorry. Uh, say, say that again because I did this. Uh, oh, sorry, I thought you were asking a question. <laughs> I was just say saying low that. trust. Oh, low trust. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Low trust. Ah, uh, yes. <coughs> um, or using another kind of terminology to save somebody's ass, to, to protect someone, okay? to make sure that responsibilities are delegated somewhere else, but they don't go on me. Okay, that's an example. Okay, so lack of trust. So that's what I'm saying. If you start looking at behavior in terms of what people value, that gives a different perspective on the concept of value itself. So if you want to help your clients, your customers, what you can do. If you start from the assumption that the stakeholders and their individual values form a complex adaptive system, you need to talk with the system. Okay, you need to talk with all of them. And what I'm saying is that, first of all, transparency is important because without transparency, you cannot have any honest communication. Okay, and you, it's quite impossible to get to know each other, understand each other. Uh, empathy is another good way for understanding somebody else's needs and values. You put yourself in somebody else's shoes, you try to see the world the world through their eyes, and maybe you understand exactly what they value. Not exactly. You understand a little better what they value. Okay? And uh, a non-judgmental attitude is also very useful. Non-judgmental means that uh, if I Maybe my value system is different from this gentleman's value system, but I'm not judging that. I'm just observing that. Okay? Because if I judge it, um, my decisions will be skewed. Okay? One thing that is very interesting to do is to bring all these people into a common space whenever it's possible. Sometimes corporate politics makes it very hard to do this. Bring senior executives in the same room with uh, project managers, but whenever it's possible, I highly recommend it. Okay. And just, and I've seen this many times, 
I've seen this many times. When you bring people into the same room and you start asking questions like, so what is important for you in this project? What do you value in this project? And then what do you value in this project? And then what do you value in this project? You put that on sticky notes and you put them on the, on the wall. You, you can see the eye in, in, in these eyes. You can see the aha moment. Oh, I, I never thought that you care about that. Yes, I do. Okay. So bringing people into the same room it is very interesting. And the question you should ask is why, not what do you want, is why you want it. If you ask what, you're talking about goals and strategies. If you ask why, you're talking about values and value. Okay, so why do you want this? Yes. So when you say actors, you actually mean stakeholders who will have an impact on mm -hmm. who get it. Yes, correct. Yes. Of course, it can become interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are a good coach or a good facilitator, uh, hopefully you'll be able to manage. Okay. And if you are not, just you know, find a good facilitator in the company or somebody who is in a neutral position and can facilitate the process. Um, so, in the end, um, my suggestion is that since value and values are subjective, complex, uh, blah, 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 multidimensional, and they are, they live in people's heads, my suggestion is make these visible somehow. Choose, the, choose a, a visual language that you can use to bring these values out into the world so that people can actually start discussing about value and values. Use a visual and make it visible. Okay? Make values and value visible to everyone involved in the project. That's a very good exercise. Um, and you can use different approaches. Uh, there's also an impact map there. If you're not familiar with the concept, just look it up, impact mapping, uh, or just bring your own. You can, you can make your own process. Um, Alan, Alan Kelly, told me that one exercise that he does sometimes uh, with the stakeholders is what he calls the um, value poker. It's more or less like, uh, uh, you know, like, 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 what we do in Scrum? Planning poker. Planning poker, right? Okay. Same thing. Except that the planning poker is for estimating effort, right? We use the planning poker to have a systemic understanding of effort. Bringing it, bringing it to the, the estimated different perspectives. Good. A value poker is similar, except that you do that with the stakeholders and you give cards to the stakeholders, and you can ask, okay, how much do you value this thing? Or it could be this feature, or it could be this strategy, or this approach, how, how much do you, each of you value this stuff? Okay? That's a very practical exercise that you do, and even, the, even if the actual values that you, receive, that you get may not be completely meaningful, just the process, is helpful. Just, you know, just the fact that someone can, could ask, okay, well, I value this thing so much. Why do you don't value that much? Okay, or vice versa. Starting this kind of conversation is extremely useful. It brings more, a more shared understanding of value in the culture. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I'm hoping that you are going out of this room with, with more questions than when you came in. Uh, because it's a complicated subject and uh, I, I did not want to give you uh, recipes or prefabricated solutions. What I wanted you, what I wanted to give to you was uh, an overall of the complexity of the problem and maybe you'll find your own approach. Maybe you'll find your own way to discuss about value with your stakeholders or actors uh, in a more um, say more mature way, more systemic way, okay. which is not just money, but a lot more. And I'm done. Thank you very much.